I am very delighted to be able to talk to you about how we built an AI startup and some of the lessons that we learned along the way to help maybe save you some of that pain. So firstly, why an AI startup? In 2014, 2015, it was quite buzzy. People were talking about it. And Andy and Alex, my other two co-founders, were at a barbecue geeking out about machine learning and thought, wouldn't it be awesome to build some machine learning solutions within any kind of space? And they had some network within the call center space. So it started in 2016, going out to winter call centers, but it wasn't very fruitful. Call centers are not really interested in AI at the time. They're still digitizing operations. It's just a step too far. And that's when I got involved. We started looking at how we could make it a horizontal platform appealing to more customers, more sectors, and went super broad. And we got investors involved and started getting really some great feedback about how we could iterate the platform. So that's where at now we've built a machine learning automation platform that can build, explain, deploy machine learning models, really reducing the time and the risk for data science teams to build machine learning solutions. And yeah, what I mean from that, like the lesson we learned was really iterate, find your market. You know, it's hard sometimes when you're like really wedded to an idea, but you know, just keep, keep trying, keep iterating and you'll get there in the end. So we went from one extreme call centers to the other horizontal. And one of the things we probably should have done better was niche, niche, niche. It is absolutely crucial at the beginning that you don't try and be everything to everyone because you will get swamped. Now, it nearly killed us. We were talking to pharma one day, telecoms the next, tax the next, and we were trying to learn all the language and try and really get involved in their businesses. And yeah, I will say, you know, if you're thinking about, I want this huge vision, I want to be the next Nike, think about where you can start. You know, can you start with like the over 65s who want sleeves and just yoga apparel and go really, really niche? to build that $1 billion sports apparel brand would be the Nike for the over 65s. But yeah, think about how you can get a bit smaller because being everything is a lot of work. And then survival can come from revenue for sure. And even with investment, you need revenue. Getting early wins is great, but we got some whales and I'm really glad we did. We've got Deloitte, NHS, these really, really big customers. And uh, they have really stuck with us and they've been the foundation of our business for like the past four or five years. So it's great. So like, you know, with the governance time and these enterprise accounts are insane, you know, nine to 12 months to get, you know, you just a pass in the door to get access to some data. It's really, really difficult. And when you're hanging on, you know, cash flow is so tight, it can feel like a really big gamble. But ultimately, it works really well both ways. You treat them amazingly because they're so important to you. They get the best features, they get bespoke support. And then the other side, you get credibility and amazing use cases. And so it really does work as a great foundation. You don't have as much effort and churn later on. So it's a, a lot of time sink at the beginning, but super, super worth it from, the, from then on on. And if you can bootstrap, amazing. They're now the cool kids of Silicon Valley. But for many of us, you will be raising money. And uh, with that, I would say my advice if you're really early stage is to think about going with angels versus VCs, especially for your seed round. The check size is meaningful to a VC, or sorry, to an angel. And that means you'll get a lot more support when times are tough, when you're ringing going, COVID's happened, or, you know, gosh, you know, we're in really um, tough times. They will figure it out for you. They'll help you um, and just be a great support. So, you know, look for them on LinkedIn. They're everywhere now. They hopefully put it in their bio and um, yeah, sell that founder vision. And I'd say for all the females in the room, this is one thing that sometimes we do lack. We can be a lot more realistic and uh, we don't sell the vision like the way some of the males do. So just have in your head, Elon Musk might have gone in the room before you saying, we're going to colonize Mars and they need a billion dollars and they need it tomorrow. And then in 10 months time, I'm going to come back and ask for 10 billion, but don't worry, I've got this. Um, whereas women might be like, you know, there's a huge risk. It's a gamble. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's not what they want to hear. So you just have to be context. Think of the context of which you're playing in the game that's been played. And I would just go sell that vision. And especially angels really get excited by a big, powerful vision because, you know, you their ticket to success potentially and they want to ride that rocket with you. Now, with that network is key and it can be really tough. Now, you guys are already got a head start. You're with your own future world and that's amazing. <laughs> Um, but accelerators, innovation hubs, all of these things are great. And if you find a sector, there's probably an accelerator in there. So think Barclays, Google, Techstars. We found HS2 and they were doing a data analytics one. And that's been brilliant. We could never have got into the construction space without them. So you know, keep looking. And even there, a lot of them have investment arms like Coca-Cola I know has one, Samsung have one. So just keep hunting around and you'll really find some fruitful network within that. And even if you get a no, 
know, you get a lot of great advice from these guys because they're in the thick of the weeds of the consumer and the marketplace and they know so much. So just keep hunting for those. It's really, really great. And then finally, my last point, it is really all about the tortoise versus the hare. We are here so much about grit and determination and resilience. That's all great, but you also need a ton of patience. It is going to take you so much longer than you ever thought possible. Devon, I'm sure, can, is nodding away. This is hard, hard work. It's graft, and it is definitely not as easy. You hear about Facebook and you see all these great things, but they are very, very rare. The rest of us are out there slogging it away. And just be patient, be brave, and I know you'll reap the rewards. So has anyone got any questions on that kind of whirlwind tour? <laughs> Firstly, thank you so much, Barbara, for being here with us this evening. Um, do you know what? I'm going to show you everyone with a ULO attack right now so that you can see everyone in the room. Oh, just to prove that it isn't just me stood here on my own. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, no, wonky, but there we are. So yeah, that's everyone here. Um, so I've got a couple of questions to kick it off. So how do you actually get those like whale sized customers as a startup, you know, when you're competing against all these giants? Yeah, so that is definitely plugging away with network. If you can find, so we found some partners that were didn't have our capability, but we're already in that space. And so we were like, right, you know, we can give you the AI kudos and um, and we can give you all, of, we'll give you all of our resource and power to get that account. And then from there, it was all around, you know, how do we land, how do we own that ourselves and how do we kind of, yeah, kind of take that on? So you might have to do these little proof of concepts for free and it feels painful, um, but they're absolutely worth it. And I would also say is like find a big champion within there who's as senior as possible and make them look good and um if anyone's been so you know I was lucky enough to come from Coca-Cola and you know if you've got to sit at the board meeting and all these people are there and you're like oh my gosh this is really intimidating know that your champion is thinking do not get me fired so sell them just support them and then figure out how to do it afterwards and yeah you'll be on your ticket to success we're seeing such a big sort of change in like AI at the moment. Obviously, it's a really hot topic, so you came at the right time. Um, how do you see that AI regulation playing a role in your roadmap? Yeah, I think that is one of the big wins is as a little startup, you can be super agile and try and anticipate it. So we from very early on thought about explainability being absolutely crucial. And now we're looking about how we understand bias, how we know how you can get rollback, data sets, all within our platform, how to give stakeholders the confidence that their models are actually accurate and unbiased. So that we can see, and so we're already planning for that and trying to get ahead of it, because if you can find a space where regulations high, you become what's called like painkiller. So there's this theory of candy, vitamins, and painkillers. You wanna be a painkiller because then you will find the budget. They will find the budget to, to make sure that they don't get fined. So yeah, if you, you know, talk to anyone in your network, your aunts, anyone who's working somewhere within a sector that's heavily regulated, and if you can find a solution, you're on a tick of success. So yeah, so embrace regulation as a startup is definitely, you know, you're far more agile than anyone else can be. When you say like stay agile, so that's a good term, but like how do you stay agile when something that's evolving so quickly all the time? Yeah, you know, you can you can just it is, I mean, it's just, you know, you and like we've got a team of nine, um, and it's you guys making decisions. So, you know, you're lucky, you don't have to go and create a whole paper. <laughs> so if you can see a win, you know, you talk to you, you find conviction in talking to customers and seeing what the market's saying for sure. Don't just go off on a whim. But once you've got a bit of conviction around it, then yeah, just go and pivot. You know, you we do weekly sprints, not even two weekly sprints. We make sure that we're answering all our customers that we suddenly that we currently got and then spend some time on trying to think of the news so yeah always always think about two steps ahead if you can and like how are you seeing the market right now yeah so you know luckily and I'm touching words because I am fearful of saying this but so far b2b is say quite resilient in terms of ai and we haven't seen that trickle down effect now it's not to say I can see b2c is being hugely squeezed advertising revenues are pretty tricky so I can't I can say that we can see it trickling down to us at some point, but I'm hoping that, you know, the wave of inflation going down and consumer confidence is going up. So hopefully we kind of seem to skip over it relatively in scales. Um, and if you're in the sector like we are, we can save you costs. We can be more efficient. Our story sings to a tougher market, a more recession proof story. So definitely play on those strengths um, as well. So you can definitely sing to the senior market of what they kind of want to spend their money on. It's like, so how do you know that your technology, you know, is at the right stage before you start charging customers? Like what stage were you at when you got to that point? 
I would say try and charge them as soon as possible so you you understand like if you if you go out there and you're like hey you know this is for free we're going to do it for free it's very hard for you to understand so we very early on I mean it comes to the fact that we're a bit older and so we have bills <laughs> you, want to start, you want to be like can we make some money out of this otherwise we're gonna to have to find a real job um so yeah it's kind of you know some of that conviction and that pressure is really good so charge as early as possible you get sense even if you're like this is a tenor and you know just to see if someone will go through the process of getting trying to get a po signed off or approval signed off that's really helpful um and then you really know whether you're starting to get that product market fit that everyone talks around and once you start being that product market fit is when you can really go and scale so Absolutely, I'd say as soon as you think you can start charging for it, it's just one of your great litmus tests of you know how successful you're feeling you are. Is don't try and keep going away for free and being in beta forever. Get get some money for it as soon as possible. So that, that question was from Sam, sort of another follow on from him as well. Like, how do you decide on the price? Then is it sort of you know trial and error? <laughs> So we were like, right, two things. One is we're playing to an enterprise market. Um, and so once you know it's going to take you nine to 12 months to get a contract signed off, you need to recoup that cost as well. So think about the effort it takes in terms of sales and man hours. Think about what it's going to take for you to support them then going on. So put that lens on. So that's kind of like, you know, okay, bottom up. And then what is the market doing? What are the competition? And we priced ours quite differently because everyone's kind of on a pay as you go kind of <laughs> level. And we thought, how about if we're like consistent and fixed and see if we could get the, them know the confidence they've got in their pricing and see if that would work differently. And that actually did latch on quite well. It's not to say that we don't have our problems with that because some people are used to buying it from the big cloud vendors one way. Um, but it does help, I guess, everyone understand our pricing a lot easier and for us to be able to quickly give a defined price and for us to have that conversation quickly as well. That's another one is like, you know, call one or two put your pricing on the table, say it, don't, don't haggle. <laughs> hey, it is 1,500 pounds a month. It is two grand a month, whatever. And, and get out the room, <laughs> just let's see what happens. Um, and, you know, and just see, let that settle. And then, then you'll get some feedback quite quickly. And sometimes I won't say it's price, but you can get a feeling that it is. So just keep working on it. So you've got to be bold with that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Jake would like to know, are you hiring students? I guess we're based in ECS. So is there a lot of people working on AI machine learning that might be interested in a career? So we don't have like an internship pro pro um, I guess, um, kind of program just yet. But I would say do send, find me on LinkedIn, Barbara Johnson, Core School, and send me through your CV and let's keep in touch. Because, yes, we'd love to we'd love to sort that out soon enough. <laughs> so everyone, you know, careers, here we go. Yeah. Um, and G would like to know, do you think the, the AI battle between Google and Microsoft will impact your business? Yes, but I'm hoping for good. So um, but what happens with these big cloud guys is they put out, so like ChatGPT, you've seen it, and it is useful to a point, but then it starts lying to you <laughs> or being untouched. <laughs> so there's not a lot of companies who are like, right, we're going to give you our precious data and we're just going to let it go out into the ether. So we're going to build a layer on top of that and say, OK, if you want to, for example, there's a lot of procurement process. It's really tedious. I'm sure everyone in the University of Southampton is trying to buy anything can absolutely attest to this. It's really, really hard to understand who you should talk to, what the rules are, et cetera. So we're like, could we use a chat assistant to do that process? And so we're going to use our technology and build our layer on top of it and you know, become use case centric. That's far more useful and bespoke to our customers' needs and their own information. So yeah, so take take what these good big guys are doing and, and they're generating tons of noise again for us, which is great. And so yeah, they just expand the category. So find these big ones and then just kind of figure out what your wrapper is on top of it and go for it. So, because with this like rapid progression with regards to generative AIs and LMLs, like how are you shaping your business to accommodate the advances in these fields? Yeah, just like I talked around there. And then also we're just kind of looking around how you can create um, different tooling around it that could be far more wrapped. So we could kind of create a, we've got an automation platform that's quite a user centric as in a data scientist, but now we're looking about how the end user <coughs> try to use it. And so how you could integrate that into your workflows that you've currently got, potentially you're just gonna say, hey, I'm stuck. Can you help me with X? And uh, kind of build it into everyone's current workflows, maybe through Microsoft Teams, et cetera. So yeah, just looking at integrations that we can do with our own bespoke layer around it. Cool. And like Nick would like to know when working with big customers, how do you manage project scope creep? 
Oh, you try and define it as much as you can up front. It never works out that way, um, <laughs> for sure. But, you know, if you're like, this is the context, this is what you're going to get, either is in terms of man hours or this is in terms of output. Um, it could be just in terms of delivery. So with AI, we're never really sure, you know, are we going to build you a predictive maintenance model that's going to be X effective? But we can say we're going to build you the best predictive maintenance model and we're going to do it in eight weeks and we're going to do it on this data set. And so from there, you try and be as constrained as possible. And never said that way. You always need another data set. You probably need another four weeks, but build in that, you know, like, you know, price in that you probably will need to do more work around it. And then hopefully if it does go over, you've kind of built that constraint in and said, look, this has now become a much bigger thing. We need, to, you know, to look at the budget and can you help us, et cetera. So. I think earlier you said about the importance of being really patient. Um, so Ben would like to know what's been the toughest part of your journey in regards to that? Oh my gosh, I think like we've really not run out of cash. <laughs> like the patience is, it's like, okay, Deloitte are about to sign or some big company is about to sign. They told us it was going to be, you know, next month and next week. And like, how can you kind of get that together? So the tough times are definitely like, oh my gosh, you know, you're planning A, B to Z plans of what will happen. And, you know, and, and, and you know, what if you have to let go of team members that you've become super close to? So all of those things like are really hard. Also firing people, like firing a friend, that was awful. Um, so yeah, so things like, you know, you have to be careful as they say, slow to hire, quick to fire. Um, but yeah, like all these lessons that no one teaches you in, in school and, you know, things like tax bills are like, you know, how are you going to manage accounting and all those type of things? And, you know, you get an accountant and then you just hope and pray that they know what they're doing and R&D tax credits. And <laughs> it's, it's a minefield, but, you know, super exciting. But yeah, low moments are pretty, like, you know, you lose a contract or COVID. Oh, God, that was, that was, that was something else. As we, all, we all experienced it in some form. But yeah, so it's, it's all those things. But, you know, the highs are high and it feels so personal and so exciting. And when you do get to hire more team members and you get to see everyone get be successful, it's just super exciting. Yeah, that's nice. Um, Path wants to know, how do you network with people at the earlier stages and kind of convince them, you know, that your idea and that you as a team are great? Yeah, it definitely um, takes, takes work, you know. I think aligning yourself into any of these things <clears throat> you can get yourself into like a community or even build your own. Like if you're doing something super niche, get your LinkedIn community going and see if you can find people to join and invite people in. And if they're key kind of, um, I guess, influencers or credible in that name, then you can help with that. So try and find a little cheat sheets to try and kind of own some space if you can. Or on the other side of it is, is just saying, I will do a little piece of work for you for free. And I'm going to show you how great we are and what is, what is something really that you think we can't do? And I'm going to sh show you that really hard thing. So we were really keen on how, you know, we always take on what we call lighthouse projects, like something that everyone's like, it's too hard and da, da, da. And, and we were like, if we can prove that, then you'll let us do everything else. And so that's kind of try and try and convince people that you're the one. And yeah, I'm sure it's, it's and also the, what I say though, into kind of the UK's credit is, um, startups beforehand there was no way to get into big enterprise accounts to startups you know you couldn't get through the procurement process you're just too risky you didn't have enough accounts da 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 um but now that you know you can and so you use linkedin to your credit like who's talking about it if there's someone in, in you can find in a big company that's talking about it could you go do something like ikea talking about ai and ethics and so i'm busy trying to get in there um so i can see who's talking about it and then you know try and convince them that we'll do something and show them and we you know what's your biggest pain and try and find out what are they what is their biggest need and see if you can address it in that way so just keep working on it basically and you'll find someone <laughs> So I think one of your clients you mentioned was like the NHS. Um, so Sam would like to know sort of how you dealt with any regulatory hurdles to do with sort of the data and selling AI as a service into the NHS. Yeah, data is a challenge. I think we are always erred on the side of we don't need personal identifier information. So we just need, let's say, a patient number, not even a real patient number, you know, translate that to a, a non-identifiable um, patient number, redo it. Um, and we don't need to know anyone's address. We don't need to know anyone's name. Um, but we do like to know kind of year of birth. And then, you know, all the rest of the data that comes along that, like blood types, et cetera, that's the kind of detailed information that machine learning needs. So try and find, like, even in a in space like healthcare, it's like how much actual, like, risky information do you need? Probably not that much. And then really sell about, you know, try and get, if you can, we got our ISO accreditation. It is unbelievably painful, I know. Um, but we got that because that gives you the credibility to say, we're really secure. We take really good care of your 
your data and you can trust us. And so from there, but like regulatory ones are tricky. They will take a lot more time. You have to do a lot more convincing and do a lot more presentations. But as I said, it is so worth it if you can get in because that builds that moat around you. So keep with it. But um, yeah, um, some of the areas, you need a lot of testing in some spaces um, before they'll let you in. But, and what I would say about the NHS is really tricky is they're not a great network. So um, potentially, like a really tough one so like if you're in with one nhs trust it, do, it absolutely doesn't guarantee you in anywhere else so um just think about how you can navigate that before you put too much effort in there because that is definitely time sink otherwise that's cool and lou said earlier about you know the difficulties of like hiring and firing friends and how you sort of overcome those things and no one's ever told you how to do um g would like to know how did you hire the first people at cortical um and do you have any tips to sort of make the right choices for early stage uh, startups on hiring yeah, I think definitely go with your guts, you know, you find your friends that are around, You're, you've already got a network sitting right beside you, so that's a really great start, so you've already, you know, meet as many people, try and like look there first, and then, you know, ask friends and family, etc. Uh, you have to find people at the beginning who are massive risk takers, because you are embarking on, you know, you can't tell them they're going to job for life, you really don't have any idea. Um, so yeah, so look for people who are kind of willing to get stuck in, make your job spec as broad as possible because you know one day they might have to you know do their own hr and then you know <laughs> the next minute so at the beginning it's like a really broad skill set you know they're really like kind of resilient with you and kind of gritty and in, in for the long haul um in terms of that and they can really take it someone who who's like you know um i'd say he's used to being in a big corporate and um and they're kind of used to you know like we've had applications from big, you know, meta, Google, da, da, da. And I'm like, you know, you don't have anyone to call if your IT is down. <laughs> it's you. So, you know, you kind of like, you don't have a beautiful canteen and you're going to have to, you know, like, are you ready for, you know, being a bit more gritty? And, um, you know, I just, it always makes me worry. So find people who are from the same kind of start, maybe startups that you want them to, you know, the kind of area that you're going to be in. And yeah, just think about what you're kind of what you like to who you like to work with because at the beginning it's just super intense so yeah find people you like and that you think have got the right skills and then as I said if it doesn't work out just be super kind and be like I don't think this is for you I don't think this is for me <laughs> let's part ways and be amazingly successful in our own rights I think so it leads on to the next question from Sam because just as important as the team that you work with is you'll have to think about like your investors and your whole network that you have around you so what traits do some of your best investors have Oh, we've got some amazing ones um, and they're just, you know, the, the sounding boards of, you know, going through this crisis, um, please, can you help? We've got ones that are super quiet that um, we never hear from and we send out our investor updates and, you know, they might say congratulations or good luck, <laughs> depending on what the tone is. Um, but, you know, it's, it's quite funny. Your, your angel investors are definitely a diverse bunch, but, uh, you know, the ones we found really helpful have been entrepreneurs in the past have you know exited a build a business have you know gone through the growing pains and you know they're at the end of a phone call for us and they you know they're brilliant and um also you know give you the pep talk you, you know you might be just calling to to you know rant <laughs> and uh and they're just you know there and you know like you just don't feel so alone so if you can get a bed of you know a, a, we have i think about 10 investors in our angel round and that is you know some having a mix has been great so and some have got great strengths, one you know, really key on good to market, one's far better about raising money. So yeah, you can get a really good mix of skills the bigger you make that round. And so we've got a room here filled with sort of some people that are already startup founders and some that potentially will be startup founders. So just one last question for you. So as you're looking back on your own journey as a startup founder, um, what would you say to these people in the room that are considering doing the same thing? I say go for it. What have you got to lose? You can always get a real job, as I say. <laughs> it's so exciting. It's really, really invigorating. And we need more people like you in the UK and in the world. You know, entrepreneurs are the bedrock of all society for forever. So, you know, go for it. And why not you? Like you'll figure it out. If you just don't quit and don't give up, you will figure it out. And so I think you should go for it. And I wish you all the best of luck. So I'd like to say thank you so much, Barbara, again, for um, being here with us this evening and answering all our questions. So just ask the audience to give you a big round of applause to Barbara. Thank you very much.